So the first thing I want to go through is the basics, and these are crucial for the infection chapter. So when you go through the British National Formulary, you'll find within the infection chapter the basics of infection. The first point is that viral infections should not be treated with antibiotic. So this sounds like common sense that viral infections, you shouldn't be using antibiotics for these infections, but there is a criteria where you can use antibiotics, not for the viral infection, but for secondary bacterial infection. And where would this occur? Where would you have a case where you will have a secondary bacterial infection? Well, we have the perfect example of that right now. So patients can present with viral pneumonia caused uh, by SARS-CoV-2, by COVID-19. And what could happen essentially is uh, they could develop a bacterial infection on top of that viral infection. And that's why it will be secondary bacterial infection. So it's still caused by bacteria, it's not caused by viruses, but it's on top of the initial viral infection. And if that is the case, then it's acceptable and suitable to prescribe antibiotics for these, this particular group of patients. One thing that should be taken into account is that this doesn't account for the large proportion of patients with viral infections. For uh, COVID-19, there's only evidence, uh, bacterial evidence. You will see di differing uh, values with different studies, but within the region of seven to ten percent of cases, so a very uh, small proportion of cases where you actually have uh, microbiology that's taken. Let's say there's no microbiology that's taken, then that figure can be much lower than seven to ten percent. So really, what I'm trying to say here is, if you if you look at all the samples that have taken have been taken for microbiology culture and sensitivity testing, only a small proportion, so 7%, about 7% of those have demonstrated bacterial infection from studies that we've initially saw. Uh, there are lots more studies that will be that will be conducted later on, but these are the current values that we have. The next important point is that samples should be taken for culture and sensitivity testing. One of the most crucial things with regards to samples being taken for culture and sensitivity testing is they have to be taken before commencing the antibiotics. This is crucial because the current studying methods that we use, if the patient does have antibiotics, this may cover the organism that's causing the infection and therefore you won't grow anything, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing that's causing the infection. So it can invalidate the results. So it's crucial for uh, samples to be taken prior to the administration of antibiotics. The next point is that narrow spectrum antibiotics are preferred over broad spectrum antibiotics, unless there's a clear indication to use broad spectrum antibiotics. So what we're trying to say is, if you're covering only the organisms that that could normally cause the infection, this is very important and crucial. Uh, unless there's a specific indication where you need to use broad spectrum, an example of this is sepsis. And not any type of sepsis, sepsis of unknown origin. If you don't know the source of the infection, then it's acceptable to use a broad spectrum antibiotic until you know the source of the infection. The best way of doing that is taking culture and sensitivity testing prior to administering the broad spectrum antibiotic. The dose, dose of antibiotics can, uh, can vary in accordance with the patient's age, their weight, their, uh, their hepatic function, their liver function, and their kidney function. Some uh, antibiotics are renally excreted, so excreted via the kidneys, and therefore, if they have a poor renal function, then you may have to give a lower dose because you can't get rid of the antibiotic very well. And also the severity of the infection. A perfect example of changing the dose in, in, with regards to the severity of the infection is flucloxacillin. If you look up the dose of flucloxacillin, severe cases of cellulitis where you use flucloxacillin, you can go up to two gram, uh, two gram four times a day intravenously. But those are milder, you can go as little as 500 milligrams four times a day. So that's a perfect example where you differ the dose with regards to the severity of the infection. And then the route of administration depends on the severity. Again, flucloxacillin is a perfect example. You give it, you can give it intravenously uh, for severe cases via IV 
uh, routes for two grand four times a day but for for those that are mild or moderate it can be 500 milligrams to a gram four times a day and that will be given orally now one thing to take into account is this is usually the case but it's not always the case cases where you can give orally uh, oral antibiotics um, for severe infections or if you're treating with antibiotics oral antibiotics that have a very high bioavailability examples of antibiotics that have a very high bioavailability when given orally or linezolid that has a close to 100 percent bioavailability um, and also clindamycin has a very high bioavailability within the region of 80 90 percent you've also got um, antifungals that have a very high bioavailability these will include these will include voriconazole has a close to 90 to 100 percent bioavailability and metronidazole has a high bioavailability so those may be used in severe infections if um, if you don't want to give the antibiotics via the IV route and then the duration depends on the nature of the infection so what you understand from the infection for community acquired pneumonia you may have several pieces of evidence that demonstrate five days is sufficient and therefore you'd normally go for five days but then you have to see the response of the patient um, if the patient's not responding well after this uh, after three or four days you may consider going for a longer duration of time and what are the problems with regards to going for treatment as l uh, treatment longer than you intended so this can lead to resistance uh, this can lead to uh, increased incidence of side effects associated with antibiotics and of course the cost will be higher and this has to be taken into consideration let's say you're uh, you're prescribing these antibiotics for two days longer than you should for a large large course of patients this would mean that you're prescribing two more days worth um, and that will be the cost of two more days worth when it's not required for let's say you're doing it for a hundred thousand patients over the course of several years or um, just say a thousand uh, your the cost implications of that would be uh, can be vast so it has to be taken into consideration